YouTube as well. Good evening, everybody. My name is Father Charles T. Myers, and I am the pastor of the Episcopal Church of St. John the Baptist here in Orlando, Florida, in the Washington Shores neighborhood. And tonight on The Forerunner, we have the honor and the privilege to have the Reverend Beck Cranford with us. And she is going to talk to us about ministry, life, the church, and any other topics we want to get into for an hour so sit back, relax, and just hear what the Spirit is saying to you. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Reverend Beck to introduce herself and so we can get into the conversation. Well, thanks, Padre. Uh, my name is Beck. Uh, as he said, um, I am an eight-generation Georgian. I grew up in West Georgia. Grew up with a lot of taxidermy and camouflage and King James Version of the Bible. I grew up uh, pretty much a Baptocostal fundamentalist. My dad was the guy with the big hair who said, come on, everybody, it's time to praise the Lord. And my dad used to sing a lot around uh, different churches, um, Assemblies of God, Church of God, Holiness, Oneness, and uh, some tent meetings where the Kojic got to come and we all got together. And uh, yeah, so that was sort of my experience in life. Um, rebelled um, majorly because of some traumatic issues, which we won't necessarily go into, um, but was kind of fed up with church. And then in 2002, met Jesus in the bottom of a bathtub uh, after taking a large amount of MDMA and cocaine mm. and ketamine and um, saw a crucified Christ in my near-death experience and uh, promised to follow him if he would give me life. And uh, yeah, so I went back to church with green hair and tattoos and large holes in my ears. Um, it was a time in America when evangelicals were dropping the names of their denomination off of their churches and calling themselves things like The Journey and um, river and things like that. And uh, I went to this particular church and uh, wasn't sure what denomination they were. I remember praying to God that I hoped that he would not make me a Pentecostal, um, but something rational like a Lutheran or uh, maybe an Episcopalian or Presbyterian. Um, but uh, lo and behold, it was a Pentecostal church. So I went back to my home and did some healing forgiveness work and uh, went to seminary and began to get some therapy of my own trauma and issues and felt uh, a real calling to the highways and the byways and um, really got a sense of calling and vocation as I visited Lorraine um, Hotel because for me, Dr. King, I didn't grow up knowing that he was a theologian or pastor. Um, as a West Georgian cracker, I got a different narrative about Dr. King being a rebel rouser. Um, and that's what I heard in kind of the poor white community. And um, as I began to study in seminary, I just, something kept calling me back to Georgia. And I remember thinking, I will never go back to that hell hole. Um, never say never. <laughs> never say never. God called me back to Atlanta, and here I am. Um, I work uh, with and in solidarity uh, with our friends who are experiencing homelessness, and um, yeah, I help uh, some students who are in seminary try to figure out who they are and their vocation and just lift them up. I don't, you know, try to teach them anything. I really just lift them up and let them find their way, and uh, yeah. So I'm kind of a Baptocostal that floats in the mainline circles. I got mad love for all of the different facets of church. Um, and at the same time, I think there's room for critique in some of the things that we do. Um, but I really believe um, in the church, the local church, and the local communities that can um, do good when they're focused on you know, practicing justice and mercy and, and walking in humility. So yeah, that's a little bit about me and uh, I'll, I'll kick the ball back to your court, Padre. All right, oh, a $25 million question. How has the pandemic 
affected our friends and neighbors on the streets in Atlanta? How has it impacted how you care for them? Uh, and the third, and you can interweave these, how has the pandemic affected the church and others reaching out, especially to our friends in need? Wow. Um, so I think for our friends experiencing homelessness, a couple things. I think at first it was, you know, there was sort of a spirit of fear that moved amongst a lot of my friends, but there was some doubters too that said this is a conspiracy and this is really just a move by the state to try to hurt us because unfortunately these, um, my friends who are experiencing homelessness have been used by the state and even by campaigns that talk about taking care of them but then are herded around or moved when there's a, a big event that comes into town. And so there was a lot of fear and suspicion of what this could be, especially when you know you have government G men showing up and CDC folks showing up in hazmat right. suits and wanting to test you. Um, but there was a large coordinated effort, and I can say for agencies and churches and synagogues and really a very much an interfaith movement and an interagency movement, there was a lot of collaboration. I mean, it was like they answered the calls. Like we suddenly all set down our biases and our opinions um, and started working together. One thing that COVID did specifically during quarantine was reveal um, the amount of homelessness. I think so many people may have been anesthetized to seeing it and now it was out in your face and visible. So more people gave. Um, I know we saw kind of the Costco wars that went on and people like hoarding toilet paper, but I witnessed um, sort of breath of renewal in humanity with a lot of people eager to give. Um, I mean, I was getting Amazon packages every day of like underwear and socks and um, hygiene items. And that was, that was really good. I think where we are now, I think everybody's sort of tired and they're just like, Hey, can we kind of stop the planet and get off for a little bit? Like <laughs> my exit. Um, and I think everybody's just really tired and longing for a break or the new or what comes next. Um, I, I think most people were optimistic when this started and thought it would not be a long haul. Um, I kind of went into apocalypse mode and I was like, this is going to be like three years, buddy. <laughs> and it's going to suck. It's going to burn through the church and get rid of all your impurities. Um, but that's, that's really what I kind of felt. And, um, and that sounds crazy. And I, and I am, I'm certified. I have paperwork, but I think, um, I think it has in many ways been a purifying agent and a holy fire that has burned through kind of a baptism of fire that's burned through the churches because it's rid us of our complacency and in quarantine, like all our idols are, you know, they're thrown away our production and work um, and just going at the grind, being a part of Pharaoh's economy that suddenly halted. Um, I mean, yeah, entertainment as idolatry is still there, but I think a lot of people were faced with grief and lament and our society knows how to cope better than any other society through escapism and you know whatever that might be self-harm and no judgment there but we're just we don't have the best coping skills or even know how to experience grief or lament and then in the wake of the protest i watched octogenarians who were white and who were you know from the suburbs of atlanta being faced with um, racism and learning and I watched a lot of them being humble and I mean there were some that were um, you know reluctant but I lot, watched a lot of people take a space of humility and really sit back and learn and um, so that was good and I think that's really motivated a lot of conversations across churches I um, I have some big circles of churches and um, many mainline Protestant and Catholic and um, and even some charismatic and evangelicals and I watched a lot of the evangelicals really start talking about racism um, and that made me 
I don't know. I was happy. I, I just, you know, like Dr. King says, it's sort of like, you know, once you realize there's um, injustice in one place, you can you have to start seeing injustices everywhere. And, right. um, and I feel like suddenly people are, are willing to talk about these things. And I, I know we've had movements before, like specifically on social media that have brought up things like Me Too movement or things like that. Um, but I think people are, are just so much more aware now of the levels of hurt and harm that we've leveraged often through our institutions and even in by the church as well. Right. Yep. So um, I don't know. I feel like there's kind of a spirit of repentance. I still feel like there's some people that want to carry on things the old way and get on with the show and really adapt the new normal and like move back into kind of production culture. Um, but I think there are a lot of churches that are just reevaluating who they are and what their, you know, what their mission is in their, their local place. And, and then I watched a lot of ministries. I mean, obviously the church is shut down for worship, but I watched, including your own ministry, but I watched churches that were like out there, like food pantries, like serving, like making sure that kids who used to get those book bags at school were still receiving food. Um, starting to volunteer to be child advocates in the court system. I'm really getting involved with drug rehabilitation programs. And I mean, it just exploded and I got so excited because it looked like a revival of just action instead of complacency and pew sitting. And um, I get so frustrated with church people who just want to be good Christians and attend on Sunday and, you know, give their tithe and hopefully donate some flowers and their name will be in the, in the program. I, but then I saw people move to action and it was, it was beautiful. And at the same time, it was strange because there was so much isolation and so much grief and so much lament as a nation. And even beyond the American context, just the world just crying out and, and, and protesting over unfair states and, and policies and quarantine and everything and unethical testing. And um, I don't know, it just seemed, uh, seem like a good time for people to come together and think about their humanity. And I, I can't say it was a radical change on all fronts. I still, right. see, still see some crap. Um, but I don't know. I think we're getting a glimpse of something. And, you know, I, I grew up calling it kingdom of God, kingdom, you know, Dr. Yeah. King's love of community, but I'm so hopeful for that. And I mean, that's some days that's the only thing that keeps me going that and my, you know, my beautiful baby daughter and my uh, good looking man. But, um, <laughs> yeah, just the hope, hope that I have in this, this thing that's coming. Do you see, uh, in the midst of these pro protests, because like you, I, I work with a lot of community organizations, uh, and community organizers. And I find that they, they're seeking something you know they're seeking someone so to speak um and do you think that if the church doesn't step in um with the narrative of jesus hmm. that um there will be a loss there, and, I, and I'm, I'm trying to choose my words carefully, a loss of, of just people thinking the church is uh, obsolete. Hmm. Do, you see, do you see that, you know, it, it, that this is a, a, a time for the church with humility regain the place of being a servant, a servant to all in the midst of all of this and being listening and being not only prophetic, uh, speaking a word, but really being a priest and listening. Do you see all of that coming into play um, in this season? I do. I Some things that I'm thinking about is just, I mean, we've committed so much harm in the name of Jesus, and we've done it with, um, you know, power over and domination and you know, coming with a lot of pomp and acting like we're holier than everyone else. And people are turned off by that. They want something real. But I think people are, are have never been turned off by the Nazarene. And I think we've lost sight of Jesus and that first century radical rabbi who, you know, never wanted to start another religion. 
but wanted people to live in a different type of way, a way that was revolutionary to the systems of the world. And um, I think the church has an opportunity. I think it's not going to be easy. And I think a lot of them are going to have, um, have their ego handed to them. And I, I mean, good for it. I think it's good purification. I think some of them are going to think, oh, this is persecution. And I, I don't think it is. I think it's just a little purification, um, burning out some of the dross. We, we have got to go back to the way of Jesus instead of, I mean, we've been worshiping the beast if you want to get down to it. And um, mm. people are like, what are you talking about? You just mentioned the book of Revelation. Um, this mentality, this metaphor of this power over that comes, right. wants everybody to see it and wants everybody to worship it versus this lamb metaphor of this otherworldly power that is um, self-sacrificing and sees the divinity and dignity in every human being and offers healing. And I think if the church wants to move forward, we're going to have to burn some things out, starting with Christian supremacy. I think it's an evil that has overran the church um, and still overruns the church. And I hear it in my my sweet little old folks sometimes are like, well, the, Jesus is Lord. Well, yes, he is. But I don't think it means quite exactly what, what we're thinking. You know, so um, not my personal Aunt Betty. She's actually really dope, but I'm just... So, yeah. <laughs> as a type of Karen. Um, but I think, I don't know, Padre, what, how do you see it playing out? I, I think we can't have evangelism and mission without social justice. And I think we're also turning a corner. So I, I, I was listening to a friend of mine, um, uh, Reverend Joshua Cole, Father Joshua Cole, he's also a um, a delegate uh, for in the Virginia legislature, and he was having this interfaith um, conversation. And I really like the interfaith conversation because it wasn't people of just transcendent faith. People were speaking from their tradition. And when I do interfaith dialogue, I want you to speak from your tradition, just like I'm going to speak from mine. There's not this transcendent Neoplatonism mess. Uh, that, that transcends all spirituality. And I'm like, no, that's, that's Platonism uh, with a new age twist. But what, was, what I heard was this, was this pastor, this bishop, and he said it, and it just hit me. He says, we need to go from social justice to social jubilee. Hmm. And I think that's where, you know, as we're dealing with wanting to get people to come to the table, uh, where I, I think the left of center and the right of center need to come to table. And even though they don't see eye to eye, we need to come together face to face. Because we've destroyed each other as an ideology on Facebook and social media. So if I disagree with you, you and I disagree, all I gotta do is get my little fingers going and crush you. And I go to bed feeling good because I crush an ideology that's against this, this, and this and not realizing there's a human being created in the image and likeness of God who's also on the other side of the screen. And I think that's what we need to do is come to the table and say, we don't see eye to eye on every issue, but we need to come to the table with compromise. Compromise in its realest sense of the word, with promise, that we have with promise of the common good of all of humanity and the common good of all those who need it the most, especially the poor and the marginalized and the outcast and the broken and those who have been broke by society and broke by the church and broke by the systems. And I think we have a way of introducing Jesus again for the first time. I mean, I tell my own church, uh, as many who know, kind of broadcasting on Facebook, I pastor an African-American church. And I said, it's going to be the marginalized churches, African-Americans, Latinx, others who are taking in the marginalized and advocating for the marginalized, they're going to, they're going to evangelize America again. And I don't, and I mean evangelize America in, in the deepest sense of just introducing people to Jesus. You know, the, the, the one who was lynched upon a tree, the one who God raised from the dead because God wasn't going to let a corrupt political and religious system, as Otis Moss III says, to keep Jesus down. And I think we're, we're going to be that community of misfits, of outcasts, 
of, and I love looking at Jesus's table of his disciples. He had, you know, Matthew, who was a preacher's kid turned tax collector, traitor to Rome, and they got Simon the Zealot. Can you imagine their first dinner together? Put the sword down, y'all quit trying to kill each other. And yet I think that's the way it is gonna be with the church. And how do we reach out to our brothers and sisters who may be leery of any kind of social justice-esque stuff, who really don't understand the protests that are going on because what do we say? That wasn't my sin. Especially people of our hue color will say, well, that wasn't my sin. I didn't have any slaves. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. And yet we benefit from a system that was built on the ba backs of African-Americans and slaves and indigenous and you name it. Our, our friends and neighbors, we did that. And to get people uh, to understand that in some small way, but we need bridge builders. And I think that's what we're called to do. Yes, be a prophetic voice. Yes, to the church and uh, to our nation. But we need priests just to mediate and hold each other and, you know, hold one on the other side and say, look, I know y'all not seeing eye to eye, but y'all can't let go of one another. Because that's what the body of Christ, because the body of Christ has got people on all sides of every issue there is. And, and, and to be purist on either side saying, I can't be with that person because they don't check my boxes. Politically or even spiritually and sometimes theologically, I can't work with them. Then we have become fundamentalists as those that we've seen growing up with. And so I think there, it, it is a great way that, that Isaiah 61, one and two, and Luke four, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me what to preach good news to the gospel, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set wounded victims free, to open the eyes of the blind. And I love it, to declare the year of God's favor or the year of Jubilee. What does Jubilee look like in our political system? What does Jubilee look like in our economic system? And though Jubilee has not been exercised in those systems, how can we as a church model that? Even if the world's not doing it. You know, in the early church, Rome wasn't doing it, but the early Christians modeled it. And it was our hospitality and loving the unlovable and taking in the outcast and being present in places like the pandemic, I think, uh, that the churches that have been present in the pandemic in some way will be the churches present post-pandemic. And we saw that what converted the empire was during the plagues, the Christians stayed. We're like, we're already outcasts. We'll help everybody else out. And people was like, I don't know what they do. They're kind of weird. You know, they think this, you know, this servant Jewish man is a, you know, they call him Christus. They eat his flesh and blood. It's kind of cannibalism. They, you know, all the characters. But we do know one thing. They care for our poor. Are we going to be the church to be known for that? Or have we sold Jesus out for more than 30 pieces of silver? And I think we are seeing the deconstruction of uh, the deconstructing, let me put a big ING, of the white supremacist narrative that has just so captured uh, Christian thinking in our country. And I think I, I'm hoping and praying to God we're seeing the last gasp or at least we can begin to see different things happening. And, it, and, it's, and it's a grassroots effort. It's gonna be us in the grassroots talking to one another, praying for one another, being present with one another and saying, look, we, you know, our tribalism has to go because we all in this boat together. And so I do see that. And I think God is raising up voices. The one thing I do like being with the Poor People's Campaign is Dr. Barber's voice or he'll just speak to the issues with moral clarity and, and, and the authority of scripture and the prophets. And that, that voice, a nation will listen to, and especially a younger generation. I told my church all the time, I said, our church doesn't, you know, and I tell them, I said, look, people will be attracted to who we are by what, we, what they see us do. And I mean, that's just a, a non clementure of everything that, you know, churches are not saying, what are you saying? They've heard us say it for years, but they've never seen it do. And I think of doing and, and building disciples. You know, I, I, I have been in the business of discipling people before they were ever converted. Because I'm always talking about God. We're always talking about life. That's discipling. Discipling is a way of life, not a program. 
And Jesus had all kinds of disciples in so many levels. And Jesus, Jesus wasn't picking one word. You're here and you're there and you're there. He says, no, come and follow me. So I think that the, in the body of Christ, to combine two ideas from Bart and Cone um, needs to be the lynched one and the elect one. Why are we elected as the body of Christ? To be a blessing to others. But that blessing comes because we follow the lynched one. And I think that's where we have to go. And these are just things I've been talking to other people about as we're discerning uh, what the spirit is doing. I do believe, as you say, the spirit's going to be poured out on all flesh and God going to use some folks that we never thought God could use or would want to use. And those are the very people. And that one, when you gave that, that was a prophetic word uh, months back on Joel. I sat in my office and I about cried. I said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, woo, I said, Lord, have mercy. But we've got to be the ones being the bearers of the spirit and empowering those. So that's kind of where I see where the church is going, um, like people coming together um, who are rooted in, the, you can be rooted in tradition and apply your tradition to context. And some people don't get that. But like, it's been this way all these years. Yeah, there's some timeless truths. But timeless truths are always need to be incarnational. That's what we say that in Jesus, God in Christ was incarnate, you know, uh, takes, takes on a context. How does Jesus look like in this situation? Who would he be with? And I think that's where we need to be as the church. Do you think that institutionalism, uh, I don't want to say die because it never does completely, but do you think the mindset from the trinity of butts, budgets, and buildings will now go to um, be able to focus on being more outwardly focused than inwardly focused? I hope so. Um, you know, coming from sort of that Pentecostal <laughs> holiness tradition, I've uh, so for so long people made holiness about uh, clothesline religion, what you wear tattoos, the color of your hair, length of your skirt, you know, if you smoked or dipped or if you drank or who you danced with. Um, and we've, and it's that way right now in the evangelical church. I mean, holiness basically is like how you have sex and, you know, they don't want to say it is, but that's really what they're talking about. And that's not what holiness is. Uh, I mean, holiness is something that comes from that from the inward and rises up and goes outward and transforms the world. It flips over regimes and it challenges empires and it says there's another way and it brings in everyone from all of the margins and calls them welcome and then watches them transform and go out and do something likewise. And so uh, when people say, do you know, you want a revival of holiness? Yes, I do, but it needs to be a holiness that's that is rooted and grounded really in, in the ancient tradition of what holiness is besides who you have sex with. And I think that's where most of the church is hung up with right now. And they think, Oh, well, you, you know, you have to look and you have to smell like this. And no, I mean, you know, Jesus said it wasn't what enters a man that defiles a man, but you know, what came from the abundance of his heart, right? Um, what was in his mind. And it, Peter even had that uh, experience at Cornelius's house in Acts 10. And so many people think that's about food and meat, but it was really, God says, declare no one unclean who I've declared clean. And it was really about Peter's fear of being around certain people. And I, and I think most of us um, who are, a lot of us who are still in deeply entrenched in church systems of institutions, um, are there for our notoriety and for our ego and for what we can get out of it rather than shaking up and changing the world. Uh, I mean, we're like Nicodemus. We, we want to see Jesus, but we're afraid we're going to get caught. So um, if we go down to the, you know, if we go down to the gay bar, somebody's going to see us. And if we, uh, if we go out underneath the street and we're sitting with Joe as he's cleaning his crack pipe, somebody's going to see us. And, and what would those good, good Christians say about us? where that's exactly where Jesus would be if Jesus was here today. So I think we need to be about a way of holiness that isn't just about behavior control and, you know, right. put into my body, but something that flips, flips paradigms and the way that we live life. I mean, you know, uh, it says, 
the, there's not the, uh, the fruit of the spirit against, there's no such law. So, um, you know, you meet somebody who's a preacher who cusses and drinks and that's going to turn some people off. But when you meet that preacher and you see that their life is full of love and humility and patience and kindness, I mean, you can't say one thing against that preacher. And, um, I have seen so many people who follow Christ that, aren't good enough to walk into some of our churches and, and who are treated like that. And then if they come in, you know, they're tokenized. They're always going to be the poster boy for, Oh, look at our church. What we did, we got this radical person in here and we saved them. Well, maybe not. Maybe that person's coming there to shake up some of the things that we've been doing that uh, aren't, you know, maybe they're a little bit more to do with our religion and our traditions and our doctrine than they are the way of following Christ, which I think is very much grounded in the Jewish uh, prophetic tradition. And, um, and he was also, he was also priestly. He was about peacemaking and that, you know, that's not uh, peacemaking isn't weak stuff. It takes a lot of ovaries to go out in the middle of two rival gangs and calm a, a crypt down and calm a blood down and say, can you not stare in each other's eyes and see that you're made as humans and that you're worthy and you're full of dignity. Should you? Um, so yeah i don't know no I, I i think that you are you're exactly right on you know who we are called to be present with and who we're called to be with and i do think there has to be a paradigm shift uh within the church because the church uh was i think archbishop william temple said it this way the church is the only community whose benefit is not for themselves. Mm -hmm. There's supposed to be a benefit for the world. And yet we've made it a benefit for ourselves of who we are and, and what we do. Um, and, and, but how do you uh, speak to, you know, especially uh, people who just ain't there? You know, they, you know Christianity is just them and Jesus. And, you know, we don't need to be doing all this stuff because we need to be saving souls. And coming from a, coming from a Pentecostal background myself, so I, I know. So, I mean, people, how do we maybe get some of our brothers and sisters to see differently? Um, well, I could. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. Go, go. I think... Um, I think it's really about biblical education. You know, people love to quote the Bible out of context, but I mean, we've made a, a world of parrots and they're just copying what Pastor Bob said and Pastor Bob's Uncle Bob said and Uncle Bob's Pastor Bob said, and we have failed to make disciples. People don't know anything about scripture. They run around and quote it. They talk about all this. They talk about heaven is as if it's a place that we go after we die and i and i get that conceptually but like jesus didn't come and preach about heaven he never said worship me i mean these things are not biblical concepts and the church is just we don't study the bible liberal churches and conservative churches don't we're both fundamentalists liberals want to just throw it out like i can't deal with paul i get that if you read it literally but if you look at paul and it's uh in its literary understanding i mean paul's kind of radical and pretty cool when you look at paul you know but uh, in the conservatives you know they they worship the bible the conservative fundamentalists instead of really exploring it and diving into the genres and the context and the original languages and i think it's a responsibility that we have and it's a heavy and great responsibility that we should consider to really be able to teach and the scripture and get people into it because i think it's I think once you start reading the Bible and really start studying it, I think it's going to do the work. I think it's going to change you, it's renew your mind in your actions. And, you know, I can't, can, after I've read the prophets several times, I can't sit around and look at people that are poor or people that are hungry or those that are coming into my town as strangers and foreigners or the widow or the orphan. And I can't right. continue to, to neglect them. So, I mean, scripture has a way of, of getting in us and, and working in us, but um, we got to stop making parrots. It's we need to make disciples, and I, I love what you said that discipleship is a way of living, not some program. And I think we need to we need to bring back uh, um, this kind of the nomenclature of talking about God and godliness and working in it, and until 
um, you know, you used to can make allusions in everyday conversation. And not, now I think most people are lost. You know, you, you right. reference something and they're like, what the hell are you talking about? Yep. Um, and I, I think it would be great if we had um, a church that was educated and we, and we don't need to sit up there and, and pander to them or, or lecture them. I mean, we need to say, Hey, you're big, you know, your big boys and girls are big non-gender, whatever. And y'all need to like take on this Bible yourself and you need to study it for yourself and you need to figure out some of these things. Um, and I think we need to stop saying, Oh, well, we can't teach that or we can't teach that. We got to be careful with these folks. People aren't, people aren't stupid, you know, right. they're, they're beautiful, wonderful, amazing people. And, and they can learn scripture for themselves and they can study it for themselves and have tools and act. We have more tools and more access right now. And I, I think most of us just prefer to remain, you know, conscientiously stupid about some stuff. I always say that you can take the Bible literally and not think biblically. Yeah. You can take it literally and not think biblically and not, you know, think it through uh, in its historical context and, and wrestle with it. But I, on the other hand, I said, what makes the Bible a holy book is because it's a real human book. So I've been taking my church through for our Bible study on Joseph. And so I'm bringing in the rabbinical traditions and, and, and interweaving them. And I said, just like we do, like, let's read between the lines here rabbis and other scholars of the day were doing the same thing. And this is some of the things they're saying. And I throw it out there and, and it's been enriching to us. And it's great because I have like a sociologist uh, who, who was a sociologist and a retired psychologist. So, you know, I'll throw in some of that and then they take it and run with it. And then, you know, I got one of my uh, astute, um, he's my music and he's the assistant music minister at my church, going to become a vocational deacon in the Episcopal church, but he's raised Kojic. Church of God in Christ. And he's chiming in. And I'm like, this is the church, you know, sitting at the table, wrestling with these things, deconstructing things, uh, and, and then, you know, allowing God to reconstruct things. Uh, what do you see, especially, you know, coming from, from a Pentecostal background, and I still have my feet in Pentecostalism, um, where do you see the shift in, in younger Pentecostals mm. uh, that, is, that is different, um, so to speak, than maybe the Pentecostalism we grew up in? Mm. So, um, so I see a real care for uh, a desire for ministries of compassion and ministries of just action. And getting out there and doing things instead of, uh, you know, erecting a building and having people come to you. I really see them, their desire to want and to go. Um, I also, I also meeting a lot of queer Pentecostals, a lot of lesbian, gay, bi, trans, you name it. I mean, a lot of folks that have, that still have that that fire of the spirit within them that have the desire to walk in a life of holiness and transformation and uh, who practice uh, glossolalia and speaking in tongues, but they're, um, they're, you know, they've been kicked out of um, their church of God or assemblies of God background or their holiness background. And they're, and they're looking. And um, I think they've been a real source of renewal in um, some of the UCC churches and some of the, um, uh, metropolitan churches and, um, you know, they're even, uh, going uh, to our Episcopal and Presbyterian brothers and mm -hmm. sisters and bringing in some of that tradition. And, you know, historically it's interesting because Pentecostals were often looked at as kind of the people over the tracks that you didn't associate right. in the poor. And, you know, and, and folks don't realize that, uh, William Seymour, who was an African American man was really the, the forerunner of the Pentecostal movement in America. And it's so interesting to me that a movement that started out um, led by people of color and by women uh, that spread across socioeconomic lines and was even yep. pacifist in its kind of origins and really cared about just ministries and orphanages and hospitals and, uh, you know, food programs, uh, where it is today. And, I've, you know, you flip on TBN and you see the stars of Pentecostalism, whatever that means, t selling, you know, 
apocalypse survival kits for $99.99 or um, talking about prosperity gospel, which I, I think there is some truth in prosperity gospel, but some of the stuff is opulence and, and, um, and, you know, no, I don't, I don't think I need an airplane. I mean, I could be wrong, but like some of that stuff just isn't healthy or good or, or biblical. And um, this is what that church has become. And it's also really wrapped itself in a lot of empire worship and, um, you know, and wanting a certain political power to come into being and thinking that that is God's answer. If, if, as if the kingdom of God could be voted in, uh, into America. So I, uh, anyways, I pray for them and I love them. And there's so many good people there that still pray for me. And there's people in all those amazing denominations that love me and call me daughter and friend. Um, so, yeah. I do see that there is a, a transcending of lines and you can have, you know, progressives and liberals and conservatives or middle of the road conservatives all talking together because I think we all discern together, you know, something ain't right. You know, we might not all decide on what is right, so to speak, but we know this ain't right. And I love the way, I think in, in the older versions of the voice translation uh, of the Bible would say, uh, blessed are those who mourn uh, for the world that's not right or for the world to be put to rights, as N.T. Wright would say, that, that, that we mourn for that. And I think that's what this pandemic, you, you, I, in all of your teachings and all of your, 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 your postings, you talk about the sense of lament. And I think this pandemic, I, I think what we've seen is this compound lament and grief that has hit us, the, the loss of the way of life. We're not going back to normal. There is no normal. There's a new normal. The loss of, of, of gathering together, of being present with one another. Um, the loss of an older generation uh, who may not be technologically, you know, inclined as we are, so we can reach out this way that we're doing right now or on our Facebooks and stuff and just, you know, the isolation. But it also gave us a time of reflection. You know, we weren't all entertained, you know, especially when the protests were coming out. And you know, that, that, what, why are people pouring in the streets for this? Why is this? And, and I really um, feel that, that, that this was, you know, people will always ask, or the question is, is the pandemic the judgment of God? Mm. And I'm like, if you mean that God is showing us which was already there and amplifying it, then yes, that, that, in that sense, yeah, you know, God's like, let's just take a look. And, I, and, 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 and the complacency of the church. Um, in these things and 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 you know we all got our role role my 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 friend reverend sheena roll a good friend of mine she has this whole theory on people who are insiders outsiders and in-betweeners and i like you've got to write a book on this because this helps us structure um how we deal with people in different parts of of politic life and culture life um but yeah i i, I do see that there there is this sense of of a younger generation that didn't fight the cultural wars. Um, I have friends who we would call creedally orthodox, but socially progressive. And they're like, we don't fit any narrative. I said, I get that. <laughs> you know, we're talking about we don't, because this, the extreme side over here doesn't like me, the extreme side over there. And I, I preached on Sunday talking about rendering under Caesar what is Caesar and what is God's what is God's. I'm like, what if the narrow way of salvation is the radical middle? Because it's easy to be extreme left or right. Because you got comfort, you got borders. It's easy, it's defined, but walking that radical, you know, middle, that tightrope of grace, you're teetering over here, you're teetering over there. The only thing that you've got on this is that you know that grace, that you're in the grip of grace, if you fall off either side of it, grace will grip you into the presence of God, but you have no other assurances except God, you know? Uh, and, and so I'm like, where, you know, I think that's the crucible that I think after post pandemic and, and everything, those are the voices that are gonna be heard and it'll be grassroots voices. And I think honestly, things like Zoom and technology have equalized things where you, it's not just the, 
celebrity preacher who goes on the news on one hand or the, or the press conference or, you know, Christian television. It's everyday people just sharing and want to, you know, help other people have a voice at the table or, you know, and, and I've always said this because I grew up poor in the South too. I grew up in Palatka. You know, when you talk about your daddy, it reminds me of mine. You know, I used to sing before my daddy preached and did puppets and flannel boards. I mean, we did it. You know, both of my parents are gone, but, you know, it was, that's the way I was raised. You know, you get up there and sang before your daddy preached and, and stuff like that. And, 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 and in that, I, I will say this, um, of just being raised that way. Um, what I realized, you know, being poor in the South, re being raised Pentecostal, spending my mo most of my ministry in the African American church and now second generation Latinx churches because I don't speak Spanish yet, I am going to learn, uh, um, that what would happen if poor whites, African Americans, our indigenous brothers and sisters and Latinx actually quit fighting from crumbs from the table and realize there's a table that we should be sitting at and follow the crumbs or we just create our own table and invite everybody to the table. What if there's a world like that? And, and to me, that's what Jubilee looks like. And I, you can't legislate Jubilee. We can fight for just laws to put some things in, but we can't legislate it. Just like on the other hand, you can't legislate morality however you define it. You know, <laughs> we have to live counterintuitive to the empire. And, and I think if, if we have these conversations at grassroots, I believe that we can uh, show a better way, show a, a beloved community uh, where God is moving. So do you, I, I, we're, our time is coming up. Do you, do you have any last words? And this, won't, this is your first time. This sure won't be your last time talking to us, but any words of comfort, challenge, prayers that you would like to share with the audience before we go off? Yeah, I challenge um, everyone who's watching to um, take the next three days, just three days, and see if every person you encounter, you can see them as an image bearer of God and an image bearer of the Holy One, um, no matter who they are or what they look like or how they drive and traffic, woo! <laughs> and see if um, you can't see that that's a person created in the image of God. Uh, that whole render under Caesar, but render unto God's, and what is God's? I mean, Caesar's coin might have, you know, Tiberius on it and say, uh, son of god but here we are as humans created in the image of god and god's image is stamped right upon us so uh let's honor that in one another thank you so much padre i've enjoyed chatting with you but well, thank you so much so hold on and so tune in next week will be episode four i'm not sure who will be with us i'm still lining people up but the people we have on this uh broadcast is just to to, to facilitate conversation so take this conversation, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly that you may have liked, wanted to like, and just take it and have it with somebody else. And in that, now let's come together. And, and even if we don't see eye to eye, we can look at each other face to face because in our faces is the face of God. Until next time, everybody, see you later and God bless you. <laughs>